Welcome to the uh, Lymphoma Tumor Board. I'm Tom Haberman, and uh, we have some very interesting cases. Welcome, American University and Sparrow. Our first case is that of a 73-year-old female who presented with recurrent lymphadenopathy. In 2015, she developed adenopathy with fevers. In September of that year, she had a positive PET with an SCV range of 5.5. She had a small atypical infiltrate in the marrow at that time. A lymph node biopsy was performed, which we'll review. She had a splenectomy in 2016. In August, uh, after that March biopsy, the PET was still positive with adenopathy. She had a left axillary lymph node biopsy on August 22nd of 2016. And in the interim, she was actually running half marathons, which she did up to uh, <clears throat> March. And she became ill again with intermittent fevers, 39 degrees sonograde, uh, significant fatigue. She came to the lymphoma clinic on uh, May 16th with a pet that had, a, had, that had changed. And so on the 17th of May, we did a lymph node biopsy. On May 25th, she was admitted with a gastric perforation with free air and peritonitis. And she had a very complicated recovery. Uh, 53 days in the hospital, really didn't eat much, uh, lost weight, her abdominal wound. Uh, she went back and forth to surgery and was healing by secondary intention. In July, she had a repeat PET scan and a follow-up uh, lymphoma clinic appointment on the 27th of July. Their past medical surgical history non-contributory, as was the social history. Her exam at the time uh, I s most recently saw her was really pretty unremarkable. These were her laboratory findings from the first day I saw her on May 16th, and then the last time I saw her on July 30th. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, she had an LDH of uh, 1,057 in May, and that had dropped to 184. Her C-reactive protein was up. She was thrombocytopenic, and then that had also recovered, and uh, uh, the LDH normalized. And so may we see the radiology, please? Absolutely. Uh, Jason Young with radiology. I have two PET scans here. Uh, one was right before her admission, and the other was pretty much right after her admission. And uh, you can see there's uh, a large uh, amount of disease all throughout um, her neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, which subsequently nearly completely resolved. You can see a few spots here, uh, and, and that's it. Uh, this was her uh, laparotomy site with healing activity. If we is that uptake right by the, you know, where the inflammation probably is, those nodes? No, I see. Uh, some of them are. Let's, let's drill down into that a little bit here. So same exams, uh, pre-admission, post-admission. And I'll just kind of give you a, a brief view here. You can see all these nodes are hot. The marrow's hot. Uh, she doesn't have a spleen. Uh, you can see that there's quite a bit of disease here. If you take this index lesion, it's... SCB max of 17.5, and then um, I, think I did not mention, I didn't measure this one, but um, we can do it quickly here. So if we look at like this area here, it's about 10, and that's a little note here that's 4.5. Um, this is her laparotomy site. There's these little nodules here that were not lymphoma before, and you know, if we kind of look at the CT, I, I think it's probably just inflammation after peritonitis. <clears throat> Um, and then there's a node here, uh, a 12.5. Uh, it could even be ureter activity. And then moving down into the pelvis where she had a lot of disease, it was very hot, around 22, 25. You can see here now it's like nothing. There's really, it's quite amazing. Um, she had some vaculated fluid in her pelvis that's probably inflammation or resolving infection. Um, but it's quite remarkable how well she's her disease has gotten better. Um, and then what happened while she was in the hospital, just briefly, because it's quite interesting. Um, this was zoomed up bigger, but I'm just going to come up here. And if we look at, so this is May 24th to your left. And then moving forward just a few days, like May 27th, May, and then June 13th, 
if we look at her lymph nodes, um, like you can see these nodes are quite large and moving forward, they just kind of melt away um, into June 13th. Um, quite remarkable. And, and then even gets better uh, over time. And then if we go into the pelvis, where you can see this like torpedo node here, getting smaller by June 13th, it was normal, you know, anatomically, and then it just continues to improve. Uh, so it's, a, it's really a, an amazing case. I'll end there. Thank you. They're elegantly presented as always, but this is beautiful. Can you see the pathology, please? <clears throat> Joanna Dolland with pathology. The lymph node that was collected on May 17, 2018, um, at low power shows diffuse um, effacement of the normal architecture. And at higher power is composed of large cells with prominent nucleoli, um, irregular nuclear contours. By stains, uh, it was positive for CD20, B cell marker, positive for BCL2, positive for MUM1, and positive for MYC. So this was a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, non-germinal center phenotype, and it was a double expressor showing the BCL2 and MYC positivity by immunohistochemistry. FISH was done, and there was no MYC rearrangement identified. This before the perforation? Yes. Uh, the patient then had a bone marrow collected on May 22nd, which at low power, and there are um, lymphoid aggregates present, um, composed similarly of large um, cells with irregular nuclear contours and prominent nucleoli. And it had a similar staining pattern in that it was positive for CD20. Um, CD3 is just highlighting that there were some increased um, background T cells. Um, CD30 showed a few scattered positive cells, and EBV was positive. That's rather positive. That's a fairly positive. <laughs> EBV, yes. That's correct. That's about as positive as it gets. Yes, it was very nicely positive. <laughs> so this was invo involved by the diffuse large B cell lymphoma, EBV positive. And it was um, approximately 10 to 15 percent of the bone marrow cellularity. Very good. So the question is, what do we do with her now? Observe her and repeat a scan in six weeks, <coughs> treat her, uh, treat her with rituximab, steroids, steroids, or other, and just to put the case into perspective, uh, this is uh, large cell lymphoma, the most common of the 106 uh, histologies. She's DLBCL, but she's also EBV positive, and <coughs> the this paper uh, just came out. Uh, we looked at the North American experience in EBV positive uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and, and our experience in the MER, the, the is 4.4 percent incidence. The marrow was more commonly involved, non-GCB, CD30 positive, like this case also, uh, but no differences in in outcomes. Um, the previous histology, uh, they didn't go through those historically, but it was, she had a granulomatous uh, uh, infiltrates on anything that was biopsied. And Dr. Pruthi uh, biopsied the nodes, took out the spleen, and uh, this is from Dr. Wood uh, from a couple years back. Of the three types of granulomatous infl inflammation, she had the non-necrotizing, and that can be associated uh, with uh, lymphoproliferative disorders, and uh, so why did the patient enter a spontaneous regression? Um, the first case they ever saw do this was starvation uh, back in the 80s, and I'm sorry I don't have the reference. There's a paper in 1940 that I can't find it. I was at the NCCN guideline meeting yesterday and some things, but and then EBV status, there may be some relationship also. I think we're all used to the concept that it can occur in low-grade lymphoma, 10 to 20 percent. I think the 23 percent in Sandra's original paper in uh, the New England Journal in 1984, and that was with lymphangiograms, so that was prior to PET. 
uh, they subsequently published a paper, uh, Saul Rosenberg's on this paper, of nine cases in 1980. In aggressive lymphomas, it's less common, uh, but interesting can occur uh, in EBV associated disorders. In our particular experience, I don't think we had one that did that. Um, this is a report of plasmablastic lymphoma in an HIV negative patient, an 80 year old woman who was also EBV positive stage one disease. She had an oral lesion. And interesting, uh, MD Anderson reported four cases uh, again in the PET era, which I think if we're gonna talk about spontaneous regressions, that's the way to do it. Uh, all of them presented with favorable prognostic factors. And so we'll open this case up for discussion and uh, maybe since Dr. Witzig's here this morning, we'll ask his thoughts first. Did you, did you get any EBV serology? PCR, <laughs> is there a copy number in the blood? Did she have active EBV infection that could have resolved? I didn't get it at the time, no. Did you get it later? I, th I, think, I, I think we did and I can't remember what the okay. result was. That would be one thing I'd yeah. think about is did she actually have EBV virus active and then she built, had immunity. And why, why did she perforate? Did you, the perf specimen, well, did you guys look at that? Unfortunately, they didn't get any tissue at the time of perforation, but when they went in, and when you look at the pet, it didn't appear that the gastric wall was involved. Maybe Not with some, lymphoma, and I, I think I can I think reading the surgical report and what it looks like after, I think this is the perf right here. Anterior gastric wall. There's a little defect there, a little suspicious bubble. On follow up, there's a little soft tissue here that looks like a mental patch. So I, I think it's right here. There's no lymph nodes there. Or it, wall's not thick. So I think it's unrelated. So that happened May 24th. That was a. Well, I was just, I was just the... ready to treat her. So we biopsy her like on the 17th, and then okay. I'm getting everything teed up, and sure. ready to go. And boom, yeah. the day so, before. She so in the perforation the paper that, that the group did, there was about, 20, I think, 15, 20% of people that perf before they started treatment. Yeah. And so she might have had disease there, this perforate. So I'll just throw, I just think she probably had EBV infection, and then she cleared it somehow with with. So you timing. think the EBV is driving a diffuse large B cell? It usually doesn't. Cell. I don't think of it that way. In fact, I sometimes wonder why we even stain for it, because it doesn't seem to make that much difference in what I do or, or the outcome. But in this case, I don't know how, otherwise you could put it in the miracle category, and we always accept those. They just don't happen like that very much. Tom, did I understand correctly, because I remember I saw this patient yes. briefly with yeah. you. This happened before for this patient. She had a separate episode before this where she had some she, degree of disease that got better. So over, <clears throat> she got biopsied, I think, at least three times. Real tissue biopsies, three times. Each time, no lymphoma. It was granulomatous. And she had febrile illnesses. Uh, the SUVs on the PET were in the 5 range. All of a sudden, it goes up to the 15 to 25 range. <coughs> really depending on what spots are we were looking at. And Jason showed some of the other you know, other spots, too. So. So there was this ongoing history, but I mean, if we take out the spleen, I mean, we, we took out nodes, big, big pieces of tissue. No, no, but I guess where I'm going with this is just that sure. it might be therefore a little more immunologically mediated uh -huh. than, for, for example, a starvation type thing, because, you know, um, if she had a kind of a waxing and waning course, you know, maybe there was episodes of either viremia or she just had EBV that suddenly became more visible to the immune system when she perforated and cells all got necrotic and the immune system mopped it up and then suddenly kind of identified the EBV. I'm sorry, I got here late. Did she have any previous immunosuppressive therapy? No. no. Any assessment for HIV or CD4? Counts? HIV is negative, didn't do CD4. There was a case we presented here a couple of years ago um, that was a young man with Burkitt biopsy defined in two cases and two at two time points with a MIC translocation that spontaneously regressed and we've been trying to peek back and follow him and he doesn't appear to have relapsed at least he still sees his primary doctor at some Mayo affiliated site um, so we did a literature search JD Neff one of our former, former fellows um, presented this case at a workshop and it seemed like it was more common in the spontaneous regression in Burkitt was more common in EBV positive ones. And 
Um, Elaine Jaffe published a small series at one point, um, and interestingly, the Burkitt cases that had granulomatous inflammation associated with the lymphomatous infiltrates seemed to be the ones that spontaneously regressed, and this young man did have sort of a granulomatous infiltrate associated with Burkitt, which isn't really a feature we associate with Burkitt necessarily. So it's kind of intriguing, more of a curiosity, but that he had prior granulomas. I don't know, if it didn't look like from the pictures that there was a granulomas infiltrate associated with this biopsy. Anyway. I've had two other cases. One of them was a pulmonary large cell and had a lobectomy, and that's how the diagnosis was made, and had a lot of other disease in other lobes, and he, we decided to let him recover before we started his chemotherapy and I wanted a new baseline imaging before I started his chemotherapy and his baseline imaging was a CR when he came back. I don't remember if that one was EBD positive. Was so it can happen. <laughs> and then did you just watch him? Yeah. How did he do long term? Uh, he saw me for about a year longer and said that's enough, I'm fine, he wouldn't come back anymore. <laughs> so I didn't hear anything else, I hope well. <laughs> Question from Sparrow. <clears throat> Usha Chamarki here. This is just uh, more of a brief comment. Um, we're not. I don't. I don't think we can we need to question the pathology whether this was diffuse large cell or not. But probably we're seeing uh, a, something in the natural pathogenesis of EVB driven DLBCL that has not gone to a point of no return. It is still regressed back into complete resolution spontaneously. And, and then it comes to curiosity question, can this happen again in her lifetime or not? Should she be monitored? What happens to her serology? Maybe we don't need PET scans without symptoms, but serology uh, would certainly be there. Uh, I just want to know what your thoughts are on this one. Well, our present plan is to uh, bring her back six weeks from when I last saw her and repeat the PET and then the pet's positive, then we're going to have to deal with <clears throat> whether to re-biopsy her or not or what we're going to do, but that's uh, that's the present plan. This is kind of similar to the PTLD setting, and I you know when people have tried to use PCR for EBV copy number, it's correlated, but it's not precise enough. So, uh, Well, our, in our experience, the positive predictive <clears throat> value in renal transplant was 23%. Yeah. And so we just had a long discussion about that at the NCCN guideline committee meeting yesterday, actually, on top of it. Does she feel well now? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, she, you know, she, she looked terrible for a while. Yeah, she looked incredibly good. 